Thank you. Well, thank you. That was an unexpected and refreshing introduction, Janice. Thank you so much. We're practically twins. <laughs> Who knew? And so you have rebranded. I, last time I spoke, you were still the Canadian landman, and which always I found peculiar because most of the landmen I know are women. So thank you for welcoming me to uh, the Land and uh, Energy Professionals Association. Have I got that right? Well, thank you so much, all of you, and uh, welcome back. Isn't it great just to be able to get back together and make up for two years of being stuck in front of Zoom calls at home? Uh, it's so good to see all of you here. I hope you're having a great conference, and I see we have at least one Flames fan here. Uh, <laughs> just, uh, just keep all that to... Uh, I, I certainly hope that we're going to get a Battle of Alberta. It's going to be an amazing uh, couple of weeks if we get that here in these NHL playoffs. Folks, that, thank you so much. You know, it's not just been two tough years through COVID, but four or five tough years through the energy industry, and that means in, in your uh, professional industry as well. And I just want to talk to you today about how uh, much optimism there is and reason for optimism in the future of Alberta's energy industry and what you do every day to help responsibly to develop Canada's largest industry and our greatest natural resource. But let's just start casting our minds back to where we've come from. In 2014-15, we saw the price collapse. By the way, please go ahead with your lunch if you've got it. Uh, we saw the, that price collapse that had huge impact on uh, the entire Alberta economy, on the energy industry, on your pr pr profession uh, as one of many. And then we thought it was bad enough we got into COVID in uh, the second quarter of 2020, and we saw our energy selling at the lowest prices ever on record, at the bottom of the trough, hitting minus $45 WTI, if you can remember that. Uh, and that had come down from about $70, $65 WTI at the end of February of 2020. Now, I'll tell you, there were some pretty bleak days. We couldn't sell Alberta government bonds. We were, had approaching 20% unemployment, and we didn't know how long it would carry on. And that was after five, uh, four or five tough years in the industry of consolidation, of cost cutting, uh, of a ridiculous price differential. You'll remember in October, November of 2018, uh, a $45 price differential between uh, WTI and Western Canada Select. And all of that meant that this industry was in deep trouble. And many, many had given up on the Alberta energy industry. Many had told us, Mr. Tr Mr. Trudeau, Ms. Notley, and their political allies, that we should stick a fork in it, that Alberta was too attached to this uh, legacy dying industry, and we needed to get with the program, just buy Teslas and put up windmills and everything would be fine. Well, how wrong they were. This province, uh, perhaps because the energy industry has played such a central role in our so economic and social development, Albertans understood that there would be a long-term uh, central role for the energy sector in our economy, in our lives, and that the world is better for more Alberta energy on global markets. We didn't give up, and our, go our government was elected on a mandate to uh, in revive the energy industry and, of course, the broader Alberta economy. And now we can see that we've been vindicated. For years I have said that the world needs more responsibly produced energy from a liberal democracy like Canada to compete with and displace conflict and dictator oil from many of the world's worst regimes. And I always used to say, like Vladimir Putin's Russia and the OPEC dictatorships. Well, now with his uh, vile invasion of Ukraine, we can see how right we've been all along about the importance of Alberta energy as a stabilizing force in geopolitics, in global peace and security, in worldwide energy markets. Putin was, uh, the Russian oil industry, while we've been under attack here in Alberta and in Canada, with a well-funded and highly coordinated campaign to landlock our energy, many of the companies that pulled out of the Canadian oil sands, that divested from the Canadian energy basin, ended up providing financial services, capital, credit to companies like Gazprom and Luke Oil. 
allowing Russia to become the world's largest producer of energy, 10 million barrels a day of oil, developing a dominant role in global markets, particularly in Europe. But the recent recovery of energy prices is not just a function of the crisis created by Vladimir Putin and his invasion. It is also a reflection of market fundamentals, of a uh, shortfall in investment in upstream exploration and production and energy infrastructure all around the world. And so as we emerge from COVID and the global economy gets back to normal, what we will continue to see is a significant supply shortage of uh, hydrocarbon energy in global markets. And that is despite the accelerating pace of energy transition and green technology. In fact, according to the International Energy Agency, even if the entire global automobile fleet were to be converted tomorrow to electric vehicles, the world would still be consuming 70 million barrels a day of oil. And by the way, that conversion is not going to happen tomorrow or any time soon. Because while we talk a lot about green technology in developed, developed countries like Canada, like North America and Europe, the truth is this, there are billions of people around the world who still live in acute energy poverty. And they refuse to be kept in energy poverty. Billions of people around the world who um, burn wood and thermal coal and animal waste, sometimes to heat their homes and cook their meals. And these are people who have every right to experience the benefits of reliable and affordable energy. And they will continue to develop those economies and people will continue to buy vehicles and, and, and consume more energy, more electricity, more petrochemicals will be produced. Part of that tied into green technology. So that's why the Inter International Energy Agency projects that there will be about 110 uh, million barrels a day of oil consumption a, a decade from now. And even in their most bearish scenario, fully compliant with the Paris Climate Treaty, they see about 70 million barrels a day being consumed in 2040. So here's the point. Both in the short term and the midterm, in the next couple of years and in the next 20 years, there will be significant global demand for what we produce in Alberta with the third largest oil reserves on Earth, 180 billion barrels of proven and probable reserves. The current notional market value of which, if we were to commodify all of that right now, in the range of uh, $20 trillion. You know, by the way, when I, I have sometimes, re recently I had a, a visit from an ambassador of a European country. Um, I won't mention the country, let's just say it's a country that has bought about $30 billion worth of Russian energy since uh, Ukraine was invaded and is refusing to send heavy arms to support Ukraine's defense, but enough about Germany. <laughs> and this individual was focused on um, the fact that Alberta has the fastest growing renewable energy sector in the province with windmills and solar panels adding some intermittent supply to her electricity grid and she was very she was fascinated by that and that was the focus of her visit and I said well I appreciate that we're glad to be you acknowledge the private sector non-subsidized investments that are being made in, in renewable electricity that's a good thing we support it but I said ambassador this has absolutely nothing to do with Germany or with Europe or with global markets, or the, in, the international security crisis created by Putin, because I said, it, we, our entire electricity grid, if it was renewables, by the way, I don't know where we'd get the baseload power to back that up from, but we wouldn't be exporting a single kilowatt hour of it. It has zero value as an export for uh, industry for Alberta's economy. It's not to down talk it, it's just a reality. I said, meanwhile, we have $20 trillion worth of oil here, not to mention our natural gas feedstock that could, in principle, if we got the right policies aligned, 
completely displaced, not just Russian, but OPEC to keep, uh, oil from Europe and global markets. I said, because now you're scrambling to turn back on thermal coal because you've shut down your nuclear and you become so dependent on Putin. And, uh, and now European countries are scrambling to bring in more Qatari and Saudi energy. And guess where that goes? To finance dropping barrel bombs on civilians in Yemen. And the American president is clamoring to lift sanctions on the Iranian oil embargo, which will turn into money that will be used to finance the Assad regime to drop barrel bombs on civilians in Syria. And the U.S. is now trying to lift the embargo on Venezuelan oil so that the Maduro socialist dictatorship can be enriched to continue its gross violations of human rights. This makes no sense. And none of that is going to be solved by a province like Alberta focusing on another solar farm or another windmill, as desirable as that may be. So it is time. It is time that the world is mugged by reality with Putin's invasion of Ukraine to see the consequences that bad energy policy has for global peace and security. Now, here's the good news. As a result of all of these forces, we are, this industry is back in a big way. And as I say, I think these, high, these strong prices are durable given the underinvestment in exploration and production. Last quarter of 2021, Alberta produced and exported more oil than ever in our history. Of course, in the spring, we, we, we come down because of uh, a turnaround and maintenance but we were shipping in December over 4 million barrels a day, breaking records, selling more, and generating more wealth for this province and its people. That's in part thanks to the completion of the Enbridge Line 3 replacement, but more good news is on the horizon. The Trans Mountain expansion should be done by the end of 2023. Coastal Gas Link and LNG Canada continue apace. There are important discussions about a potential second major West Coast LNG project in which we're involved and uh, the world is taking notice. Witness the recent two and a half day visit to Alberta of the chairman of the US Senate Energy Committee, Joe Manchin, who was the most powerful man in the US Congress. He didn't come through here for a 10 minute photo op. He came and spent two and a half days learning about the central role that Alberta plays in American energy security. He didn't know. Here's the chairman of the US Senate Energy Committee who's incredibly well informed on these issues. And even he was surprised to learn that 60% of U.S. oil imports comes from Alberta. And he'd like to see that become 100%. So now in all of that, sometimes I, I actually heard, saw somebody on Facebook say to me um, recently that our government has, quotes, done absolutely nothing to support oil and gas, which was a, a bit of a surprise to me because normally I'm told by my friends in the NDP and the media, that all we do is to support oil and gas. Uh, the truth is we do a lot across the spectrum to support a strong Alberta economy, but I just wanted to lay out for you some of the things that your Alberta government has done to support our largest industry under three key themes. First of all, our commitment to fight back and get a fair deal for Alberta, for our resources. Secondly, to create the best possible economic conditions to restore and renew investment in the industry, and thirdly, to plan for the long-term future, including energy transition challenges. First of all, what have we done to fight back and to get a fair deal for Alberta and our energy industry? Our government was sworn in the end of April 2019, and the very first decision that our cabinet made was to proclaim into law the so-called turn off the taps legislation, which gave us the power that Peter Lougheed used in his fight against Pierre Trudeau over the National Energy Program to control our exports of Alberta energy if other governments make decisions to impede our industry. Now, obviously, this was a message being sent to our friends in British Columbia about their campaign of lawfare to impede the construction of TMX. So we brought that law in day one, hour one of this government, and within weeks, BC announced that they were downing tools 
on their obstruction of Trans Mountain and would support it. Uh, it would grant the permits, and I am pleased to report they have continued to do that for the last three years. It wasn't even election, an election issue in the last BC campaign. Second, we, uh, right after that, I went to a downtown hotel here in Edmonton to appear before a Senate Energy Committee, a Canadian Senate Energy Committee hearing on the tanker ban, Bill C-48. Made our compelling case about this being an unprecedented discrimination against one province's resources. Um, and the next day, went, flew down to Ottawa, met with senators, appeared on their committee on Bill C-69, the new Federal Environmental Assessment Act, we call it the No More Pipelines Law. And I committed that we would build a national coalition of like-minded provinces, First Nations, unions and others to oppose these anti-growth bills, and we did just that. In fact, we exceeded my expectations. We managed to get the Senate of Canada, a majority of whose members were appointed by Justin Trudeau, to vote to basically kill the tanker ban C-48 and to rewrite Bill C-69. Unfortunately, he used his Commons majority to override uh, those decisions, but we, we found allies. We had eight, seven other provinces aligned with us against Bill C-69. And we've kept our commitment to challenge the constitutionality of these laws. We have a judicial reference pending at the Alberta Appeal Court which challenges C-69 because it is for us a clear violation of the promise of the Constitution, Section 92A, hard won by Peter Lawhe that says provinces have the exclusive uh, jurisdiction over the development of their natural resources, including oil and gas. And we, frankly, expect to win on that key constitutional principle. We kept our commitment to create an Indigenous Legal Defense Fund to give an equal voice to pro-development First Nations in our court system because for too long, for far too long, the small minority of Canadian First Nations who are opposed to pipelines and energy development have gotten nearly 100% of the voice share, particularly in our courts, with the feds paying their legal bills and others being paid by US-funded NGOs, special interests. And so we decided to level the playing field. We created a legal defense fund for the majority of First Nations in Alberta and BC, for example, who are in favor of responsible resource development, and we have partnered with a group of them in their legal challenge to Bill C-48. And this is a fascinating story. I don't know why the media doesn't cover it more. But here you've got First Nations who are saying that the federal government violated its constitutional obligation to consult with First Nations, grounded in the honor of the Crown, on uh, their economic rights. And what they're asserting in that case that we are funding is that the duty to consult doesn't just relate to uh, the environment, it, and doesn't just give First Nations the right to say no, it also involves their economic rights and aspirations and their ability to say yes to major projects, and that we're looking forward to, the, to uh, that challenge as well. We committed to create an advocacy hub for, for pro-energy advocacy as we've done through the Canadian Energy Centre. And, you know, it, it took some criticism in its early days, but I really, as people interested in the industry, I encourage you to look up their website. They've done some really solid research on things like Indigenous engagement in the industry and the inv improving environmental performance uh, and so many other issues, running advocacy campaigns in key markets around the world right now in the United States in New York City and Washington and elsewhere, the Look North campaign, uh, raising the awareness of Americans about how they could benefit from more Canadian energy. We committed to getting transparency on the foreign-funded campaign to landlock Alberta Energy and appointed uh, Steve Allen to lead that process. And he identified in great detail tens of millions of dollars that had been funneled in to Canadian, uh, to, into Canadian politics and Canadian uh, protests and legal challenges uh, as part of the tar sands campaign to landlock our energy. We promised to ban foreign money from our politics as we did for so-called political action committees and to defund, to remove any government of Alberta funding from organizations involved in that campaign as we've done. 
We've created an environmental, social, and governance secretariat in my department at the center of Alberta's government to uh, better coordinate and communicate the huge progress that we're making on all of those fronts. We committed to improve our, our advocacy efforts and build relationships, and I think that Senator Manchin's historic visit here is evidence that that is working. He's invited me to appear before the U.S. Senate Energy Committee to tell Alberta's story and to work with him and his colleagues on developing a North American energy strategy. We committed to take historic steps to get our First Nations more involved, like meaningfully involved, in not just uh, contracting and benefit agreements, but in actual substantial ownership stakes and equity shares in major energy projects through the creation of Alberta's Indigenous Opportunities Corporation, a billion dollars of backstop from the Crown to help First Nations that don't have big balance sheets or, balance sheets or financial depth uh, to get involved in, in big deals as, and it is working. A, consort, a group of eight Northern First Nations recently buying a 15% share in the Northern Courier Pipeline system. A group of six First Nations being involved in the um, in a new natural gas electricity plant uh, near Hinton and many other exciting projects that have either, either been approved or are in the works. Uh, really a game changer to see First Nations with a deep, meaningful, long-term financial stake in responsible energy production. We also, where possible, fought for common, to get common ground with Ottawa on issues affecting us, and, and we won on a number of fronts. We got an equivalency agreement for the regulation of, of industrial emissions, doing that through Alberta's Technology Innovation and Emissions Reduction Program. And believe you me, that has saved the industry here billions of dollars compared to the alternative, which would be having our heavy industry, our energy industry, micromanaged by the Federal Environment Ministry would have been a disaster. We managed to get an equivalency agreement on methane regulations. Uh, and uh, the goal there, to reduce by 45% our methane emissions based on the 2014 baseline, to do so by 2025, we're on track. And the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers estimates that Alberta's smarter, more focused, and lighter touch regulatory approach to methane it means that compliance with our regs is one third of the cost it would have been had we allowed the feds to micromanage this with no understanding of the industry. A huge cost saving. We managed to get an equivalency agreement with the feds on uh, woodland caribou species pr habitat protection up north. Now, I know that's not a front page issue, but it's a big deal. If the feds had gone ahead with their plan, it could have represented a sterilization of up to a third of the landmass of northern Alberta, off limits for energy exploration, forestry, and could have cost as much as 5% of our GDP, according to an independent econ econ economic study. So we managed to trigger what's called Section 11 of the Species at Risk Act, as Alberta, in a much more nuanced, local, smart way that engages communities and is mindful of economic and social cost, uh, managing that habitat issue, a huge cost saving for industry that removes an enormous piece of uncertainty. Um, we have fought hard to get a strong incentive from Ottawa for carbon capture, utilization, and storage infrastructure. Because as you know, while Alberta was an early adopter of that technology going back 15 years, and we were often mocked and criticized for it, CCUS is proving its potential to be a major uh, vehicle for decarbonization. And uh, the U.S., under the Trump administration, brought in their 45Q investment tax credit, which has led to a huge expansion of carbon sequestration in the U.S. We needed to catch up. And so we've spent much of the past year with our top issue with Ottawa being uh, landing this investment tax credit, which we did finally in the recent federal budget, which clears the way, we hope, for the Oil Sands Pathways Group, uh, and we hope also in the future conventional producers to tie in, to build up our, uh, our carbon sequestration infrastructure as a game changer. We, at, at, the at the bottom of the, of the crisis two years ago, 
went to Ottawa and said, look, we've got tens of thousands of unemployed, largely blue-collar folks in the oil field service sector. This is devastating. We also have an environmental liability in unremediated wells out there that's been stacking up from decades ago. Help us help you with the economic survival strategy through COVID and address this environmental liability. So we got a billion dollars for the, for the site reclamation program administered by Alberta that has approved uh, the, the completion of uh, 19,000 well abandonments, I should say, and 9,600 reclamations with a big focus on Indigenous partnerships, cleaning up wells on reserves and involving Indigenous contractors. We promise to intervene at uh, Canadian energy regulator hearings wherever Alberta's interests are at stake, and we've done just that, strengthening our voice. So I think we have done, well, I know we've done more than we committed to, uh, to fight for the, our vital economic interests in our energy sector. But we also promised to create the best overall economic conditions uh, for renewed investment. We did that, first of all, through our job creation tax cut, the one-third reduction in the uh, general corporate tax rate in Alberta. NDP had raised it from 10 to 12 points, and we've cut it from 12 to 8 points to have by far the lowest business tax rate in Canada. And if you combine pr provincial, federal, and state federal, we're lower than all but uh, six of the United States. And that has helped. That has helped to strengthen the balance sheets and the, and the financial uh, durability, the resilience, of many of our companies at a critical time after many of them have been hemorrhaging uh, for the past four or five years. We, of course, have implemented our red tape reduction strategy. The goal was to re has been to reduce by one-third Alberta's regulatory burden because I, I really believe that, you know, we talked about the, the pi price differential for much of the past few years, but we also had developed a regulatory differential where it was becoming increasingly difficult to get a, a simple project approved in Alberta. I'm sure many of you encounter that in your work. And, uh, and we saw other jurisdictions just eating our lunch, Saskatchewan, Texas, Oklahoma, and others in terms of uh, approval timelines. Part of this was, bluntly, to restructure the Alberta Energy Regulator. We were not getting the results, and they weren't even trying to run at the speed of business. We basically well, we, we re replaced entirely their board and almost all of their senior leadership, uh, focusing the organization on faster decisions, and, uh, and we've managed to cut the, the timelines for approval for most projects at the AER by more than 50%, while overall across the economy, eliminating more than 120,000 Alberta government regulations, reducing by 20% the regulatory burden of the province, moving us from an F to an A in the Federation of Independent Businesses Red Tape, Report, uh, Red Tape Reduction Report Card, um, and from 10th place in Canada to second, and next year we'll be first. I'm, I'm sure of that. We committed to pass a Royalty Guarantee Act because both under the Stelmac and the Notley governments, royalty reviews had really destabilized investor confidence in the fiscal framework for oil and gas development in Alberta. And we wanted to, to be clear about this, that we are not going to tinker with the royalty structure, that investors can count on it, plan on it. And so we did pass that act to add certainty. We committed to a natural develop and implement a natural gas vision a part of our industry that had been perhaps neglected uh, didn't get the adequate political attention which is why we appointed an associate minister for natural gas and now electricity it's why we've been implementing the recommendations of Hal Quisley's report uh, from four years ago on survival for our gas industry it's why we brought in the uh, temporary storage protocol it was, that was a hard piece of work. We had to negotiate an agreement with over 120 up, mid, and downstream players and the regulator. And that helped to save our uh, many gas companies when we were looking at gas prices in the, well, at some points in the summertime, we were trade selling Alberta gas at, at negative prices, 30 cents. Many companies couldn't get equity or credit. And so the agreement that we negotiated resulted in about a buck fifty lift in prices, which helped many of those companies survive uh, so now to live for this much better day. 
We provided uh, over $100 million in a retroactive property tax relief uh, to particularly dry, shallow gas producers that were in a, a financial crunch when we came to office. And we committed to modernize and, and, and the liability management framework to help address some of the issues coming out of the Red Water decision. So again, on, on these and other areas, we've done everything we can. But there's more work to be done, for sure. It's, ne it's never completely done, more work on red tape reduction. But uh, I'm proud of these achievements. And then finally, planning for the future. Uh, I talked about our national natural gas strategy. We see that as being a key for our long-term future. And part of it means doing everything we can to get a second major West Coast LNG project done. And I can tell you we're well involved in discussions on that potential. And I think it's going to happen. Uh, and we see huge potential for long-term future demand of our natural gas through an expansion of the petrochemical industry in, in Alberta, but also the huge emerging hydrogen sector here. And we're supporting that through the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program, plus all of these other policies I mentioned and more. In fact, we have signed off on $24 billion of uh, credits under the Alberta Petrochemical Incentive Program for new pet chems, new pet chem projects and hydrogen projects. In, we have seen the announcement of over $18 billion of intended capital investment in low or zero emitting petrochemical projects, the biggest of which would be uh, Dow's proposed, the world's first net zero ethane cracker east of Edmonton, a more than tripling of the, si of the size of their current plant out there, which would be probably about a $12 billion project when it gets to final investment decision, and there's a very good chance that they'll actually expand from there. Um, so 18 billion in petrochemical projects, plus we are hot on the trail of about another 10 to 12 billion dollars of capital investment in that sector. And then hydrogen, as you know, Edmonton hosted last week Canada's first hydrogen conference to over a dozen international delegations, major companies from around the world and already $8 billion, I believe, of hydrogen projects that have been announced for the province. We believe between our natural gas feedstock, our human capital, our uh, carbon sequestration infrastructure and geology, and, and, our, and our policy alignment, that we are set to become a major global hub uh, for hydrogen. All of this ties into, as I've said, CCUS. And the investment tax credit helps, as have Alberta's historic innovation uh, in investments in that. The Alberta Carbon Trunk Line, which is a great example of the infrastructure we're building. All, building. all of this is a win, win, win. It's a win for our traditional energy industry because it means decades of demand for our natural gas, which means upstre upstream exploration and production, midstream pipelining jobs, service jobs all across rural Alberta, high-tech jobs for these low-emitting projects, great blue-collar jobs, particularly here in the Edmonton region. It, but it's also a win for diversification because they're, all of these projects will be producing products for a global market and a great story for the global environment because every additional um, unit of natural gas that we get to global markets helps to reduce, for example, coal emissions. We, another part of the plan for the future is working closely with our uh, oil sector on reducing emissions to ensure that they have access to capital and that we have access to global markets. And so we are working closely with the Oil Sands Pathways Group on that. I've talked about the CCUS investments, but we're also very keen on the potential for small modular nuclear reactors to be a, an alternative energy source for, for example, steam production uh, in the oil sands and other technologies. We make huge investments in supporting that kind of research and development in part uh, through Alberta Innovates. And then finally, like good Albertans, we're trying to skate to where the puck is going to be. And that is, uh, we think, the biggest emerging challenge and limiting factor in this amazing Alberta economic turnaround will be people. Not enough people and people without the right skills for the jobs of the future. We're already starting to experience that in a real way. And that's why we are making record investments in our skills for job strategy starting in high school, 
in expanding vocational learning and apprenticeship opportunities. We're building uh, the SATE and NATE collegiates that will be vocational high schools attached to those great polytechnics. Largest ever investments in job training programs like Jobs Now. And now in this year's budget, the Alberta at Work strategy, $600 million, where, we're, for example, we are going to be buying seats in our post-secondary institutions, in our polytechnics, in our colleges, to uh, help to turn out students for jobs that we know will exist in the future. So when I'm talking to Dow or Air Products or other major investors, this is a central issue for them. And facilitating migration from across Canada with our recent Labour Mobility Act, which automatically recognizes credentials granted by other provinces, our Fairness for Newcomers strategy to get skilled immigrants to work at their skill level in Canada more quickly, our, re our reformed Alberta immigration program, and our marketing plan to bring a, a larger share of federally selected immigrants to Canada. All of it is a people strategy that I believe is going to end up bringing 80 to 110,000 people net in population growth in Al to Alberta in the foreseeable future. Let me wrap up by saying, uh, yes, the recovery in the industry is largely about price, but it's also because we're doing everything we can to create the best in policy uh, context for renewed investment and confidence in this industry, which is so important uh, to the world. So thank you very much for your invitation. I'm looking forward to your great questions. And thank you for what you do. Thank you for believing in this province. Thank you for believing in your industry.